And there we go. Cool. I just realized we should have put the Comic Fest logo in here too. <laughs> I'll take it up with management later. Okay, I'm gonna to start to broadcast and then people can come into the room, so. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, why am I so quiet? Uh, why is it? Oh, it's these new headphones. Um, all right. So we have a couple of minutes. I'm going to grab some water. <laughs> it's good I to see you, Ron. I beer. How's it going, man? Is that beer? Of course. Oh, that was a um, good idea, Ron. Should, should I bust out some beer? <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. Whatever gets you through, man. <laughs> Thank you for doing this again. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Mr. Hollywood Big Shot now. Ah, uh, that's a nice background. I have kittens behind me. We have new kittens and they're just <laughs> fighting. It's kind of cool. I thought the boys have to wrangle those, don't they? Is that their job? Uh, I think it's like, they're like mirror images of each other. Like one cat's <laughs> bigger than the other and, and one boy's bigger than the other and they just, you know, each of them beat on each other. <laughs> It's uh, very interesting. How are you, Ron? Oh. You know, trying to get through it like everybody else, day at a time. I know. You know, know. Um, Cam is still plugging away. I, I don't know how, but we're still going, you know, so. Um, yeah, that's great to hear. That's good thanks for hear. doing the Comic-Con panel, too. That was good. I watched that. It was really good. Um, I was just psyched that my uh, Calvin and Hobbes piece went so high, like yeah. right at the last minute, because someone else was, someone else was auctioning stuff off, and immediately they went up like really high, and yeah. mine was really low, and I was like, oh man, <laughs> I just don't want to embarrass myself. No, that's a whole different like subgenre of people. They just I, there's these folks that like they just wait for that last like minute or 30 seconds and go crazy like totally you know. totally yeah and um i'm just trying to figure out you know i have so much original art and with the show all these new people are like ordering all this stuff and <laughs> clearly the prices of my stuff was too low <laughs> so, it was so low that I took it off the site. And, um, <laughs> I'm now conferring with like, you know, different collectors saying, okay, like, tell me how much I should be charging for this stuff, you know? So. Well, maybe we're going to have to do, we might have to do a, a toast and butter uh, tribute show out here then. Oh, you know, I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole woke art show that, that could be done. Like there's all this artwork that I created 
that never got used in the show, but sort of informed everything. We should do a show like that. Definitely. I saw your, uh, I saw your, your Instagram chat with Lamore, was it two weeks ago or whatever? And you were talking a little bit about this, the art on set, like, you know, can anybody take that or should I give this any, you know? Seriously, like, I think I was told not to take stuff so right. they could take it, you know? <laughs> it was kind of crazy. And am, am I like live or something? Like, or no one can hear us? Yeah, yeah, you're <laughs> live, guys. So. Live. Okay. <laughs> So, right. Are you guys ready to start, Natalie? Or? Well, do you want to wait for more people to come in the room? Or more people there. Ahead. People are slowly um, coming in. So maybe um, just give it a few more minutes for people to come in, and then we can. I'll do a very short intro, Keith, and then turn it over to you. I yeah. Let me know what you want me to take down the slideshow too. So. Oh, yeah. So are you, are, I'm allowed to. Sh yeah, you're, you're. Once once we take this down, Keith, you should be able to share your screen. So oh, okay, because right. I, I know you were you had stuff to show. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're ready, we can let this we can get this party started and let people trickle in on their own and catch up. Okay. Well, 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 what time is it? Give it uh, just a couple more minutes. Only six o five. Yeah, we can wait. It's 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 not uh, six o five. I'm sorry. Yeah, six nine o five. Nine o five. Yeah. <laughs> Depending. Yeah, that's funny. Nobody wants to hear us uh, catching up on Facebook. <laughs> Maybe they do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's I, 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 that's the most interesting talk, right? Um, I've, been, I've been doing all this press for the show, yeah. and I'll get onto these podcasts, and I'll have the greatest conversation for the first 10 minutes, and then they'll go, Oh, okay. Let's let's start recording now. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, we just had the greatest conversation about all this cool nerdy stuff, and and now you're just starting. It's just like immediately. If I was doing a podcast, immediately I'd I'd have it going just right when people get on. There you are. That's advice for all you podcasters out there. <laughs> No, actually, I do. I do have a library podcast, and the last one I recorded with someone, I kept it going after it was officially over. And I think yeah, the next forty-five minutes were the best part of the yeah conversation that we did cut in like earlier. Yeah, through, yeah. Through editing, we can make it seem like that was part of the plan. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So whatever you're ready, Natalie. All right, let's go ahead. So welcome everyone to Marin Comics Fest 2020. It's a little different here this year. We're all in our boxes. For any of you who, this is your first time, Marin Comics Fest started in 2017. I think that's right. Um, with Marin Comics Fest, supported by Marin County Libraries um, to celebrate the narrative power of comics, art, and illustration. There have been some wonderful events over the past year at our library locations. So it's really kind of exciting to do it virtually this year and actually opened up opened us up to having Keith here because he's on the East Coast otherwise he wouldn't have been able to still pop by our libraries so that is a cool effect of this reality we're in at the time um, so we're very pleased to have the special event tonight I'm sure you all know who Keith is already and uh, hopefully you're already watching woke on Hulu if you haven't you should it's a great show I've been enjoying watching it um, and seeing everything come to life um, and if you want to learn more about Marin Comics Fest, you can go to their website, marincomicsfest.org. You can kind of see what past events were, what a normal September would have been like. <laughs> Hopefully next year we can have a normal September and have a lot of events to celebrate comic art. Um, and just a few housekeeping things before I turn it over. We are collecting questions in the Q&A box. You can see at the bottom of your screen, at the end of Keith's presentation, there will be time for Q&A session and we'll pass your questions along. And I'll just turn it over and we'll give you the power, Keith, to have the screen. Okay. And I will disappear. Do, 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 do. I am ready to go.
Hey everyone, Keith Knight here. Happy to be back in the Bay Area, kind of, virtually. And um, I wish I could be there live um, when the show was done. I like, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Like we're psyched that everyone is stuck inside and has to watch TV, but uh, I would much rather have had it um, wonderful screening and a Q&A after uh, live in person, but hopefully that will happen in the future. Anyway, let's get it started. Since time and not a year and a half ago, a lot of readers have been asking me this question. Has this once macho he master gone all soft now that I'm a married man? The answer is yes, I've gone all soft, soft and supple. It's true, the best thing about getting hitched is being able to use all your wife's girly products in the bathroom, stuff I wouldn't be caught dead buying in public. Okay, let's see, we've got some anti-crab ointment, anal wart remover, and a peach melba loofah scrub. Shh, not so loud with the loofah scrub. That's right, with lava soap for me. We've got rosemary and aloe vera and eucalyptus leaves infused with hibiscus shampoo, organic sea kelp and land semen exfoliating wash, colloidal oatmeal, and placenta enema. Honestly, y'all, using this stuff does make a difference. A lot of folks have been noticing. Gee, your skin feels terrific. So this is my comic strip, uh, The Cave Chronicles. I've been doing it for many, many decades, and it's uh, semi-autobiographical. So what I do is I take something that happens to me, uh, whether it's using girly products in the bathroom, and then I spin it off into uh, a, a rant about something. And usually there's some sort of twist at the end. And um, sort of the tried and true uh, police brutality thing, sort of, uh, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's pretty evergreen, really. Um, so how did I get here? How did I get to this point in time? Um, I grew up in Boston. And let me show you the picture that I associate with Boston at the time I was growing up. Uh, it's this one. Um, I grew up in Malden, Massachusetts, just north of Boston. And in the 70s growing up, this is a very iconic picture. There's a protest about um, the busing that was going on in Boston, which were taking black kids and, and busing them to white, uh, white schools. And um, there's an interesting history behind this picture. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of white people and it's a white man holding the flag and about to stab this black, and he's a lawyer, by the way, this black man's a lawyer. And as I've grown up and, you know, learned more and more about America, it's amazing how much of a metaphor this photo is, which is this, this white, person, white male, using the flag to stab a black man. And so hopefully you'll get the metaphor by the end of this talk. Anyway, so I grew up in Boston and I never had a black teacher ever. And there was a study that just came out uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, that said that if a black student has one black teacher, one black teacher between kindergarten and 12th grade, uh, the likelihood of them going to college goes up 30 to 35%. I never had a black teacher, but I had a substitute teacher that was black. And even though he didn't teach anything, he had a study class, he was an aspiring cartoonist. And so he would sit at the desk and draw and just doodle. And he'd allow me to sit next to him um, in the classroom and doodle alongside with him. And just seeing this person that looked like me that was an aspiring cartoonist was enough for me to want to become a cartoonist saying, wow, that guy looks like me. I think I can do it too. So uh, it was a huge thing. My first black teacher I had when I was a junior in college. And uh, what he was, was an American literature teacher. Uh, but the writers he assigned uh, us to read were Ralph Ellison, Richard Wright, Maya Angelou, and James Baldwin. And so when people in the American literature class were like, why are you giving us all black writers? He said, I'm giving you all American writers. And that blew my mind because 
in school were always taught that American writers are um, Mark Twain. Like, that's what you immediately think of. And here was a teacher who was working within the system to subvert the system and let us know that everything that we're taught isn't exactly everything that needs to be taught. I, I would argue that James Baldwin should be taught just as much as Mark Twain, if not more. Anyway, uh, because of this, because of these, um, these books that I read, my comics went from being stuff about keg parties um, in college to what's, what it's like to be a black man growing up in America. Um, so my comics really changed, is some of my favorites. This is dedicated to that one black kid, with Cave Chronicles by Keith Knight. This is dedicated to that one black kid who lives in that tiny ass town off the highway in the middle of nowhere. This is dedicated to that one black kid who is not into hip hop in high school. Black Sabbath is not black, you know. This is dedicated to that one black kid who gets used as the reason why someone isn't a racist. I can't be prejudiced. My mom invited one to my 13th birthday party. This is dedicated to that one black kid with hair people want to touch all the time. Back off. Is it like a Brillo pad? This is dedicated to that one black kid who gets told they're not really black. Yo man, brothers don't do what you do. Hey, it's a compliment coming from me. This is dedicated to that one black kid who always gets asked by white folks why they can't use the N-word. Why ask me? I don't use it but you could if you wanted to. This is dedicated to that one black kid who wonders if they measure up to the myth. This is dedicated to this one black kid. So this is one of my uh, most popular prints that I sell at uh, comic cons like this one. Um, it's like black people bingo. And so when people look at it, when black people look at it, they go, oh, that's me. Oh, that's me. Oh, that's me. And then they go bingo. Um, but I mean, this translates very easily to that one Latino kid. It translates very easily to that one Asian kid, to that one uh, gay kid, uh, to the one disabled kid. Like it's, it's, it's a very personal thing, but it's also a universal thing. And um, so it resonates with a lot of people. And um, almost all of that stuff has happened to me. Um, not the I, I didn't live in that tiny ass town, but I feel for when I see these small towns and I'm like, man, imagine what it's like to be a black kid in that town. It's pretty hardcore. Here's another one of my favorite ones. It always amazes me the way people react when they first enter my bedroom. Holy smokes, what the hell are you doing with that blow up doll? Folks are often surprised to find a feel me up Wilbur doll in my bedroom, although I don't know why. Tickle Me Elmo may be the number one doll for America as a whole, but Feel Me Up Wilbur has been selling like hotcakes in the black community. They come in quite handy. Although not for the use the manufacturer originally intended. And he's saying taxi, and he's thinking black man equals stabbed in back. Off duty, off duty. But wait, look, black man plus white guy equals okie dokie. Get the hell in here, boys. You see, because five black men standing on a corner without Wilbur is a gang. A five black men standing on a corner with Wilbur is a basketball team with a coach. They're banned in Boston, so I bought a few to send to my friends back east. Oh my God, look, it's Hootie and the Blowfish. So yeah, this is one of my classic ones that started out when I was in San Francisco. I was trying to catch a cab and no cab would stop for me. And you know, you sit there and go, why aren't they stopping? They don't have anybody in the car they're available. Um, and it wasn't until a, a white co-worker of mine came by and we were standing there talking and then I caught a cab just like that. Now they weren't happy that I was the only one walking into the, the cab, but uh, you know, it's those type of things that give me the ideas to, you know, take off and run with it. Now, um, 20 years ago, I've been doing this forever, but 20 years ago, I was asked by uh, um, another website to do a new strip. And they wanted something similar to the K Chronicles, but I wanted to do something exactly the opposite, which is instead of being autobiographical, I wanted to take it from the news. 
um, instead of being a multi-panel, I want to do a single panel. So I came up with a, a comic strip that I call Think. Now, I really love this logo um, because if you look at it, it this I, I, and I, I've wondered about it for a real long time. It kind of looks like Snoopy. It kind of looks like Snoopy with the the dot of the eye is the eye of Snoopy, and then the parentheses are the ear. There's something soft and Snoopy-like about it, and uh, and also think is actually my name, my last name spelled backwards without the G, which is really interesting. So I'm going to run through this stuff really quickly, uh, these think cartoons. Um, I'm just about to sneeze. Um, I'm so glad I'm not in public because you get all scared that everyone thinks you got COVID, but um, I actually think I'm allergic to our new kittens. But I'm not sneezing. Okay. Um, Denny, serving black since 1997, if signs told the truth. So this is the very first one I did. Oh, see, it says Keith Knight 2000. So uh, this was about, um, uh, it was, Denny's got sued for, for um, seating white people that came in after black people who were waiting and then making black people pay before they got their food. Um, and it wasn't until a bunch of Secret Service men in DC um, it happened to them. They brought a lawsuit and then everyone jumped on. And um, I think Denny's has changed its ways, but I don't know because I haven't been there in 25 years. Your sister had the baby. It's a boy. The exact moment radical black activist Thomas X realized that, yes, indeed, he was an Uncle Tom. What was promised? 40 acres and a mule. What was got? 40 ounces and a pit bull. This just in, police have just released a description of the alleged gunman who's been terrorizing the downtown area. Please don't let it be a black guy. Please don't let it be a Middle Eastern guy. Ha, they'll never catch me. Ah, the power of white privilege. A screening for women only, that's discrimination. I demand entry. Hey Louise, we got another snowflake wanting to get a pap smear. Send him in. The penis monologues with Will Chamberlain, Jimi Hendrix, and Milton Burrow. How was it? Way, way too long. That one's for all you older folks out there. You're doing this because I'm black, aren't you? Oh, uh, now see, why do you always have to play the race card? So the race card. Um, black on black crime. Um, what about Chicago? Um, get over it. It was a long time ago. Uh, these are all things that people say when they want to avoid what I think is a very important discussion that we should have. And that is the discussion of racism in America. Not racially charged events, but racism in America. It is America's biggest problem. It is a problem that's so big that countries other countries are using America's racial problems to pit Americans against each other. This very um, Facebook thing, if you look around Facebook and you see all these different posts and stuff, a lot of them are foreign actors. A lot of them are domestic actors to pit Americans against each other because we've never had a real discussion about race. The discussion about race only goes as far as when white people feel uncomfortable, which is about 5.2 uh, seconds. And we have to stop having it dictated by white people. Uh, this is generally how the talk of race goes. One night at the old gallery opening, frankly, I don't care if a person is black, white, green, purple, or brown, me too. Who the heck are all these green and purple folks white people are always talking about? The K Chronicles by Keith Knight. I'm sorry, I consider myself relatively open-minded, but I have to draw the line at purple people. I know the same PC, but purple people are nothing but barely civilized knuckle draggers. Believe me, I sat next to one in second grade. When I was growing up, a purple family moved in next door and the whole neighborhood started to smell like Fig Newtons. 
And I swear this one guy was hired at my job just because he was, well, you know. I heard green folks have three nipples. I think I'd better be going. Me too. Be careful walking back to your car. The purple people might get you. So, yeah, I don't know if you've seen the show or not, but it's in the show too. Um, unless Avatar is a documentary, there are no blue people. There, there are no green people. There are no purple people. So, you know, when people talk about these purple people and green people, it really is an insult. I mean, we have to couch these discussions in reality. And then there's the folks who say they don't see color. And when you say you don't see color, that means there's something wrong with seeing color and that it's supposedly uh, a compliment that you don't see color. Um, you should see color and you should be proud to see color and you should value having friendships and family and peers and mentors that are people of color. You should value diversity. And sadly, we don't. We value the contributions of people of color, but we don't value the people. Um, if it wasn't for black people, all the music on the radio that you'd hear would sound like those fluty Renaissance fair music. Um, it would be a not, not a happy place. So um, that's the least you should be happy about by people for. Anyway, so in 2008, um, I jokingly say I made the worst mistake of my life, which is launch a daily comic strip. Now, keep in mind, I enjoy drawing a comic strip for 11 years, but um, no one under 50 read it. So now, uh, okay, I know some people are going to say, I read it, I'm under 50, but uh, for the most part, uh, I don't know. It's kind of interesting um, to do this comic for so long and, and um, not have that many people read it. Like this 2008 was the worst year in newspaper industry history. Like all these newspapers went under, but I just had a kid. So I was like desperate. <laughs> so I launched the strip, uh, but it was fun. And I, I love the format of the daily strip, uh, whereas K Chronicles is sort of a diary strip and Think is this editorial strip. Um, a daily strip is kind of like people just want to check in with characters every day and see how they're doing. And so it was, it's like a sitcom, you know, um, and I really enjoyed it because I developed all the other characters, uh, Clovis and Gunther and Kirsten, my wife and the kids. So it was really fun. So I'm just gonna show just a couple of the nightlife strips. Do you think extraterrestrials are racist? Why do you ask? They never abduct people of color. It's easier to catch white people at night. Now, <laughs> when this ran, I love it because uh, my readers are so smart and uh, they sent me all these newspaper clippings of the first couple that was abducted by aliens in the United States. And it was a mixed race couple. So it was a black husband and a white wife. And, but I always say that they got caught because of the white wife. Uh, anyway, this next one, I got the most letters of, of any cartoon I've ever gotten. Vet mentoring. A guy in my unit smothered an IED, took one for the team. When I got home, I went to tell his loved ones what kind of sacrifice he made. Turns out he was gay. I was the first one to let his partner know what happened. I've shared things with soldiers that I'd never tell family and friends. War does that. Here was a guy who gave his life for his fellow soldiers, but wasn't allowed to share with us who was waiting for him back home. If we're not fighting for this soldier's freedom, then what are we fighting for? So I did this about don't ask, don't tell, which was a law in the books that said, you know, you could be gay in the military, but you couldn't tell anybody about it. And so I did this this strip. Um, the reason why it's in color is because it's a Sunday strip and my strip runs on, uh, it's ran on Sundays. I think in the Washington Post, it ran in, I think the Boston Herald and um, it ran on Sundays in uh, the San Diego Union Tribune. So after this strip ran, 
I started getting all these letters from military. San Diego is a big military town. And so I opened them up and they said, you changed my mind on Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And I kept on opening these emails and they said, thank you for, for explaining to me why we shouldn't have Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And so like, it was amazing because as cartoonists, you wish your work could change people's um, beliefs in something or their minds on something. And, you know, there were all these emails from military saying, you changed my mind on this. So remember I told you that the Sunday strip ran in the Washington Post? Well, this was our last decent president and um, he's in the Oval Office and on his desk are the Sunday comics. Now, that strip that you just saw ran in, I think, June of that year. And in October of that year, our last decent president repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Now, I'm not saying I had anything to do with it, but the evidence is right there. It's right there. Comics can change the world. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Anyway, so um, about five years ago, I was doing a comic about Ferguson, uh, about Michael Brown being shot, another black teen being shot and being mistaken for like a 30 year old when he's like 12 or something. And um, so I was just frustrated because I had been doing police brutality cartoons forever. So I saw this photo and I was just, you know, just the look on her face and that sign just made me say, what more can I do, you know, besides these comics? So I decided to put together a slideshow called They Shoot Black People, Don't They? And I compiled 20 years of my police brutality cartoons. And uh, so I started doing these slideshows at universities and schools, high schools <clears throat> and colleges around the country. And, um, and I just wanted to explain to people that like, this is not a new thing because so many people online were saying, why is this happening? Why is this all going on right now? It's Obama, Obama's doing this. Obama's responsible for police brutality. So, um, so I just wanted to explain to people that the only reason why you're seeing it all right now is because people have cell phones and they're recording it. So you're seeing it, but this has happened forever. And uh, so I compiled these and I'm just showing you a few of my favorite ones. Mr. White police officer, how many shots does it take for four white officers to defend themselves against one armed black male? A black male? Well, let's see. Blam, 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 blam. 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 So if you notice that figure in the corner, she's looking at her watch. That is a trope that cartoonists use to make it seem a lot of time is going by. Blam, 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 blam. Blam, 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 blam. 41, don't you think that was a little excessive? Listen, you people could avoid getting into these situations if you would just lighten up. So this is a strip I did, I think in 1999, and it was about Amadou Diallo. He was a, an African immigrant in New York City, and he was in his vestibule of his apartment building when he was uh, surrounded by cops, uh, four cops. And um, he was reaching into his wallet, uh, um, into his pocket to, to take out his wallet to, because they wanted, you know, they wanted him to identify himself. And as he was reaching into his wallet, they shot at him 41 times. So he died. Um, they went on trial. The trial was moved to the whitest part of New York, um, which is what they, they only do that when there's um, something involving black people and uh, white police officers. And, um, and they got off. They got off because they said they were defending themselves. So what I wanted to show in the comic was 
when does it go from defense to offense? Is it 10 shots? Is it 20 shots? 30, 35? Like when does it go to offense? And that's it. Like that is, I mean, it's absurd to me. It's completely absurd. And to this day, it continues. And this is the firing range where police officers do target practice. How come all the targets are black? What do you mean? They're silhouettes. They're supposed to be black. I'm talking about the Afro and the FUBU logo across the chest. Well, I'll be. So this strip ran in 2008 or 2009. Um, about four years later in Florida, there was a soldier, a black female soldier, who asked her local uh, police department if she could she could do target practice on their firing range. And they said, sure, yeah, come on in. And soldier, of course. So she goes in there. And when she goes to shoot at the targets, the targets are blown up black and white pictures of black male teenagers. And one of them was her brother as a black teenager, as a, as a, male, uh, as a teenager. Her brother was older, but now he's, he, but it was a picture of him as a teenager. And that's what I'm trying to say. So, you know, when the police captain was asked by the media, like, you know, WTF, he was, he just said, well, what we're doing is not illegal. That was it. What we're doing is not illegal. So essentially, you're using black teenagers as target practice. And that's the culture that we live in. Um, after 10 years of living in San Francisco in the Richmond district, I was hanging up posters for my band at a bus stop and a, a cop car comes speeding up across Fulton street, pulls up in front of me, a cop jumps out, and says, what are you doing? And I said, I am hanging up posters. I have a black stapler right here. I'm going to put it down on the ground. Um, he gets on the radio and says, we have the suspect. And um, I said, what suspect? What are you talking about? He goes, you fit the description of someone who's robbing houses in the neighborhood. And I said, what's the description? And he said, six foot tall, black male. I asked him, is there anything else? He said, nope. So uh, keep in mind, I had dreads coming out of my head that were crazy. I looked like a black sideshow Bob uh, from the Simpsons. And if anyone saw me robbing houses, they would say a black sideshow Bob is robbing my house. So um, a six foot tall black male gives police the excuse to stop just about any black male. So I look down Aguela Street, there's a cop car coming. I look up Fulton Street, there's a cop car coming. I look down towards the beach, there's cop cars coming. And I was like, this is it. Wow, this is that thing I've been writing about forever. And it's really interesting and different to be on the inside looking out instead of the outside looking in. And so I was just trying to like look at people's faces as they were coming by. And it's amazing how frightened people were um, when I caught their eyes. And it's amazing how quickly you just can become public enemy number one if you're black in America. And so uh, my white roommate was on a bus up the street, coming down the street on a bus. And he said, he saw all these cop cars at the bottom of the hill. And he said, well, there's SFPD hassling another black man. And as he got closer, he saw my hair and he was like, wait a second, that's my black man. And uh, the bus pulls in across the street and he jumps off. And so this is the thing that uh, shocked me was uh, my roommate, white roommate, about 5'4", comes bounding across the street against traffic, against the light. And he's screaming, bloody hell, get the F away from him ah, like at the cops get on ah. and all the cops six of them all turn around 
and they see this guy running at them, screaming, angry as anything. And they all turn around and they go, take it easy, man. Take it slow. It's okay. And that, to me, was shocking. It was the epitome of white privilege. Because if he had been black, if he had been brown, he would have been tased, he would have been beaten, or worse. But the cops were treating him like he was the manager. And that, to me, was the traumatizing thing. And uh, we tried to capture that in the show. Um, but it was kind of crazy. Um, but here's the thing. Like, if I had gotten shot, you know, people would have read and said, well, we had a black stapler. That looks like a gun. Um, he was in a rap band. So, you know, oh, he had, he might have had something in his, I probably did have something in my system. Um, they would have said, oh, well, what can I say? I'm sure plenty of people would say, well, he should have complied. He should have complied. And that's the thing that drives me up a wall. We shouldn't have to be perfect to live. Again, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have to be perfect to live. I grew up in Boston. And I've seen white people tear down cities because their sports team has won. Tear down cities because their sports team has won. And cops let them do it. Cops don't shoot anybody. They don't beat anybody. So when people get bent out of shape, because people are tearing stuff up, because cops are murdering people, I'll give them a pass, especially black folks, because black folks built this country for free. They have every right to tear it down over murder. Uh, anyway, a cruel joke to play on a black jogger. Thief. And then the cops show up. So this ran in, in a bunch of different newspapers. But my Charles, Charleston uh, editor wrote to me, uh, called me up, actually. And she said, you know, um, all these people are calling up and uh, complaining about your comic strip saying, you know, I'm a white person. And even I think this is racist against black people. And I said, really? She says, yeah. Like, I said, do they, all, like, what are they saying? She's like, hello, I'm a white person. And... I think this thing, even I think this over. So I said, are they all white people? They said, yeah, because white people always announce themselves what that they're white. Um, even when they write to me, they say, I'm a white person, I like your strip. Um, anyway, uh, so I said, is there any evidence that black people are calling up? And she said, no. I said, you know why? She said, why? I said, because black people wouldn't look at this strip and think it was racist against black people. They would say that the thing that this comic strip is depicting, which is police brutality, is racist against black people. And she said, well, what do you want me to say to the people? I said, say to the white people that if you complained as much about the incident that this is depicting, which is police brutality, if you complained as much about that as a comic strip, as if you complained as much about the police as you do uh, uh, a hip hop record, then something might change, something might happen. But people don't want to do that. They don't want to do, they don't want to have the, the real change. They want to just, you know, this is depicting it. This is not the real thing. Anyway, this is the real thing. Um, this is about five blocks from my house, my apartment in Los Angeles. Um, this is the 10 freeway, and this is Chips. I don't know if you've ever seen um, the show Chips, but uh, or the movie Chips, you, you kids out there. But this is one of uh, California's Highway Patrol's finest, and he is trying to prevent a 63-year-old black grandmother from walking across the 10 freeway. She's schizophrenic. So he's doing it by tackling her and then throwing haymakers. Now, 
um, he still would be employed by the California Highway Patrol if it weren't for somebody deciding to film it. Um, otherwise, he would have gotten away with it. But here's the thing what happens is he gets fired. First, he goes on paid leave. So cops go on paid leave. So they get paid to do nothing after they kill or beat somebody. So they make their money and they spend the time like basically trying to figure out what's going to happen. Like if they're on video, they usually get fired. But here's the thing. They just go to the next county and get another job as a, as a police officer. In North Carolina, a cop can be fired for brutality and then his record is hidden from the public. And then he just goes to the next county and gets another job. The police unions are so strong that like they can just pretty much do anything. And it's, and what happens is, so he'll get fired, he'll get a job somewhere else. Her family sues. And then we, the taxpayers, uh, pay for the millions of dollars her family gets. Now, listen, they deserve all the money in the world. But if you really want cops to police themselves and weed out the few bad apples, take money out of their pensions. If you dinged the pensions of police officers, not just the, the abusive ones, but their, their partners who uh, enable them um, and the people in the precinct who have let this person, because people know which hot-headed cops, which ones are hotheads, ding everyone's pension. If you take money, I swear to you, you take money away from them, they will start policing themselves. They will find the bad apples and be like, nah, I, I, I'm not going to get my pension dinged because you want to punch somebody out or shoot somebody. So, um, you know, something to think about. So everybody sits there and says, why is it going to be about race? Why is it always about race? It's always about, why do you always, eh, eh. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't black people always bringing it up about race. White people made it about race a very long time ago. And, and that's what I found is doing the police brutality, uh, brutality slideshow that I did. So many people are so, um, don't know anything about America's past. And it's, it's, it's education, like it's purposely done to keep us in the dark about it. But if we learn about America's past and how it was built, um, then you would know that all this stuff that's happening from Trump and all these crazy militia nut crate people, police brutality, all of it, you would, you'd be like, oh, okay, that all makes sense. Um, America is, the N-word was invented by white people. <laughs> white people made, made people that looked like me three quarters of a human being. Like, that's, that, that wasn't me. <laughs> so um, we are lacking in black history. And the fact that we take Black history and try to squeeze it into four or five feel-good stories in the month of February is um, abusive and absurd and silly because Black history is American history. Black music is American music. You know, um, it's integral to America. Um, if you look at American slavery, which we learned nothing about, nothing. I got uh, a paragraph and I just saw this great strip in the nib this month. Uh, and it was very similar. My history books would say, oh, you know, the, the masters, some of them were mean, but most of them treated their s s slaves like family, it's so nice. And then there's all the happy slave movies, like The Patriot, whenever they show the hero and the slaves are always like happy slaves and everything. Imagine being a black actor, having to deal with that all the time. Anyway, um, so this is a modest timeline uh, and this is American slavery. So I need people to understand this red line. So 339 years, what could you build what kind of business could you build if you had 
three, over three centuries of free labor. Three centuries of free labor, 300 years. What could you build? What do you think? I think you could build a country. Um, and then after that, you had 90 years of, you know, separate but equal. So it's like 400 years of a knee on somebody's neck. What could you do? And just so you know, um, if you break something, how long does it take to fix it? Um, usually I ask for a pencil when I'm live. I say, does anyone have a pencil? They give it to me and I break it really fast. Because I want to explain that when you break something, it's a lot quicker to break something than it is to fix it. So if you have 300, over 300 years of slavery, 90 years of segregation, do you think like 50 years of, of uh, civil rights, you know, 70 years of civil rights, like 40 years of affirmative action and like eight years of a black president, you think that's going to fix, fix it all? because it takes way longer to fix things than it does to break things. So um, we won't even acknowledge this. Um, we won't even acknowledge it. So it's gonna take at least a thousand years <laughs> before this is fixed. And here's the thing, people say, well, it was such a long time ago. It was such a long time ago. And um, get over it, get over it. And I say, you know, Jesus was a long time ago. And why doesn't anybody get over that? And then, you know, after they're offended, they think about it and go, oh, yeah, that's a good point. See, when Obama opened up the Black History Museum in DC, he opened it with a woman whose dad was born a slave. I was listening to these slave interviews, these former slaves in the 1930s. And they were saying, you know, when they found out they were free, when their, their owner walked up to them and said, y'all are free, now get the F out of here. And so suddenly these folks, generations of folks had nowhere to go, nowhere. They walked into town, they just walked into town and they couldn't find a place to live they couldn't find jobs. They couldn't do anything. They wandered. They just wandered the land. And like that happened with millions of people. So when you sit there and say, oh, it was a long time ago. It wasn't. There was 10 years of reconstruction, 10 years of reconstruction. And then after 10 years, politicians were saying that's enough. Everything's equal now. Everything's fine. And then they started putting in all these anti-black uh, laws. And that's when they started um, banning baseball players. They were actually, Jackie Robinson wasn't the first professional black play baseball player. There were blacks playing in the major leagues in the 1800s, late 1800s, but they banned black people then. They banned, they did just a lot of different things. And, um, so, you know, that 40 acres and a mule strip, they were supposed to give 40 acres and a mule to everybody. They didn't give anything to every, anybody. So when people sit there and say, well, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Um, there were no bootstraps. So I, I, I kind of describe it like this. The Racial Equity Institute does this in North Carolina. They say, basically, white people, if you walked into a room and black people were playing Monopoly for two and a half hours, um, and black people turned to you and said, hey, you wanna play, you know? And, and white people were like, um, well, no, cause you own all the properties and the railroads and you set up all these hotels and, and black people just turned to you and say, I started out with $200. You're gonna start out with $200. What's the problem? That's America. That's America. White people have experienced affirmative action for centuries 
in this country. Centuries. And it's so ingrained to not even acknowledge it at all that, you know, white people feel like they've done everything. And it's understandable because our history books just say the Pilgrims and Christopher Columbus and, and George Washington and Mark Twain and just you've done everything, like so much so that if there's proof that white people didn't do it, it was aliens. Aliens did it. The pyramids, aliens must have come down and done it because white people didn't do it. It's completely absurd and so much so that my brother-in-law was telling me how, you know, one of the white parents at soccer was complaining because their nephew didn't get into college and they always blame it on affirmative action. Like somehow, some way, it wasn't the 8,000 white kids that got in, but it was like the thousand uh, kids of color that got in, that kept their nephew from getting in. And the same thing happens in the writer's room in Hollywood. I had someone say to me like, you know, yeah, I didn't get a gig because of the, uh, the, the diversity hire. Now, keep in mind, there's like 12 or 13 white people in there. And then there's like maybe one, you know, Indian kid in the corner <laughs> and they blame them. Like somehow, some way, it's always a person of color that's keeping the white man down. I don't know how, but it just happens. So why don't we teach about the history? Of the, why don't we teach about the real history of this country? And it's not that, it's not all a big downer. Um, Robert Smalls is a, a, a guy that I did cartoons uh, about. And this guy was born a slave in Beaufort, South Carolina. He worked on a ship as a slave and when he put on the captain's hat, when, when the captain wasn't around, everybody would say, wow, you kind of look like the captain when you put that hat on. So he devised this brilliant escape plan that when all the white dudes were getting drunk off the ship, he put on the hat and sailed the ship out. He knew all the codes and he went and picked up his family off the coast. And then he had to sail past all these Confederate ships and then raise the white flag when he got to the Union ships. He went to Washington, D.C., convinced Abraham Lincoln to have freedmen in the Union Army. And then when they won, uh, when the uh, U.S. Army beat the Confederacy, which, you know, like, I don't know why we have these things, these Confederate statues, like, um, in Germany, they don't have Nazi statues. Uh, they, you know, Confederate statues are like participation trophies. Uh, anyway, so he went down and bought his old house that he grew up a slave, and as a slave. And then, when his master's wife came out of a sanitarium because she went crazy, he let her sleep in her bed uh, in that house until she died. If that's, I don't, I can't, I don't know why, but if that's not forgiveness, like what kind of, that's sympathy, empathy, I don't know what it is, but it's crazy. Josephine Baker, she left this country because of racism in Harlem uh, during the Harlem Renaissance, and she went to Paris and just became this, the biggest thing in Paris. But what a lot of people don't know is she was a spy. Um, and she was a spy for the French. And um, there's a great graphic novel about her. And there's just a ton of stories. You know, a lot of the stories of the Black experience is super horribly depressing. But it's something that needs to be talked about and told. Because that resonates today. That is part of everything. Um, you know, the, um, the wealth of the average white family is like 200 years ahead of the average black family. And that is, you know, that's not surprising. Uh, when most Americans got their first homes, when the government offered the GI bills, low cost loans, um, 
uh, mortgages for people to get their first homes in the 30s and 40s. And um, they didn't allow black people uh, to get these loans. And so you had black soldiers who risked their life in World War I and World War II, many fighting for the rights of others that they didn't have at home. They'd come home and they'd be stationed in the South and get treated like crap. And yet white people got these loans and they got their first home and they got to pass it down and pass it down and pass it down. So there, you know, when people say, oh, I, well, it's not my fault. I didn't benefit from, yes, you did benefit from, you benefited from the fact that your family was able to acquire um, real estate. You benefited because your grandmother or great grandmother were able to get educations at institutions where my grandmother could not get educations at institutions and pass that down, pass the amount of money that they've made from, from whatever jobs they had. And, and not only that, they say that the victims, the ancestor, no, the, the descendants of Holocaust victims have a higher rate of depression and suicide than the average person. So what happens when there's, what, what is passed down? What is in my genes from 400 years of what what my ancestors have gone through what do you think i am carrying so this is one of the pictures that made my um, presentation not kid friendly uh, this is a lynching um, if you look at the people's faces at the top this is this was a party this was something that they did it's let's find a couple of black people and kill them and um it wasn't just to punish them. It was also to send a message to the black community. Uh, they would hang them from trees uh, so people would see um, what's going on. Um, they would take pictures and send them as postcards. Uh, there were police officers in here um, in plain clothes. They would look the other way. Um, and, and there's something to be said about the police. The police were started as slave patrols. Slave patrols were poor whites that were hired to keep the black community in line. So um, they were hired to, to find runaway slaves, uh, to, to beat and punish them. And when you, you know, people say, well, that's the South. Uh, the, the first recorded slave patrol, I think, that we know of is Charleston, uh, Massachusetts. Um, just outside of Boston. And I remember even when I was a kid, people would say, don't go to Charlestown. Um, this stuff carries on. Lynching went on into the 60s. There were children. There's a kid in here in this picture. These kids who are attending these lynchings become teachers. They become doctors. They become businessmen. They come up, become politicians. Now, if there are kids in the 60s seeing this stuff, they are here today. And people just don't put that together. And at the same time, those folks who couldn't get um, mortgages for houses had to move to the crappiest parts of town. Generally, the crappiest parts of town are generally the east sides of towns uh, because that's where the the sort of airflow went and that's where all the pollution was that was all so generally that's where the black neighborhood was and banks would circle that part on the map and say don't give loans to those people that's redlining and those type of things carry on and on and on uh, there's a story going around right now oh well i suppose you don't want me to leave uh stay on this picture so this is just a modern day version of this. Again, this is the same as this. This cop was on camera. He was staring into the camera with his arm in his pocket and he didn't have a care in the world. He never felt like his job was in jeopardy. He felt like he was doing his job. 
and the other cops just turned and looked the other way. The jobs of the police department today are the same as the slave patrols in the past. And people say, no, no, that's not true. There's just a few bad apples. It's not just a few bad apples. If it was a few bad apples, and people always say it was a few bad apples, then why is it so, why does this continue? Why don't they just clean out the few bad apples? And when you say, oh, it's so, so many good cops. Listen, I don't see a good cop as someone who lets something like this happen or lets any police reach out. The good cops are the ones who try to turn the other cops in. And I'll tell you this, there are good cops out there, but they get pushed out of the police force. There are more protections for bad cops than there are for good cops. And that's why it has to change. That's why it has to change. When you're a good cop, you are less protected than the bad cop. And that's a problem. So again, this is just the same thing. Slavery, picking cotton, turned into sharecropping. They started paying people pennies a day. My mom was a sharecropper in Georgia. She made pennies a day. If she didn't pick enough, she was beaten. It's the same thing. People in jail, you know, they, they, they uh, outlawed slavery except for punishment in jail and penitentiaries. So a lot of the biggest plantations in the South became penitentiaries. And people in jail, they make clothing, they make electronics, they make license plates, they fight fires unless they have COVID. Uh, this country was built on the backs of people working for nothing. And it continues to be that, exploiting people. That's why you have politicians freaking out about, oh, we can't give them $600. Like they won't go back to their jobs. Well, that's not the problem. The problem is, is they don't get paid enough. They don't get paid enough. And, and we, have, we have grown this country like exploiting people. 70% of the people are throwaway people. Trayvon Martin is the exact same as Emmett Till. That's Emmett Till alive, that's Emmett Till dead. And today, when Breonna Taylor, a, a, a person who's supposedly as a healthcare worker is an essential, essential worker, the, the cop didn't even get in trouble for killing her. The cop got in trouble because he put some bullets through some drywall. So when you tell me all lives matter, I tell you to kiss my ass. Um, if I have a bumper sticker, and this is the Black Lives Matter thing, if I have a bumper sticker on my car that says, save the rainforest, it doesn't mean F the other forests. If I say, save the whales, it doesn't mean F the other, F the dolphins. When we say Black Lives Matter, it's because our lives are devalued. You like the music, you like, you like the sports, you like, you like the art, but you don't like the people. And I'm saying America as a whole devalues Black life. And we have to start valuing it. He takes a knee. Everyone's like, this is not the right time to do it. This is the wrong, you're protesting wrong. You're protesting wrong. Here's another athlete that protested wrong. And it's funny because you hate them when they're doing the right thing. But, you know, you love them when they die. You know, John Lewis, every Republican couldn't stand him. He dies. Oh, he's a wonderful person. <laughs> Kiss my ass. Uh, so instead of taking a knee, folks riot. And um, frankly, 
if it wasn't for the riots, the guy who killed George Floyd, he was being charged, he was being charged with third degree murder. I have police people in my family and they've never heard of third degree murder before. And then they didn't charge any of the other officers that were there. It took a riot. It took them tearing stuff down to, to get them charged. And they, it's not, they won't, they won't even get convicted, but at least they got charged. Rioting also had the LA uh, police, LAPD, their funding cut. Um, it also caused um, Confederate statues to come down. Uh, it also, you know, it, it also caused one, one state to get rid of qualified immunity, which, you know, keeps cops from being able to get sued, which they should. Um, so, rioting does, actually does stuff. There's never been a time when the oppressed, when the oppressor was like, oh, you're taking a knee, you're being so quiet and nice. Okay, we'll give you stuff. Um, you know the Tea Party that they teach you about? The Boston Tea Party? Where they dumped a bunch of product into the, they dressed as Native Americans and then dumped all this stuff into the water, destroyed all this stuff. That was a riot. And that's celebrated. So it's funny how we pick and choose this stuff. Um, this is a comic about Martin Luther King back in the day. This is always a funny thing when people post, oh, Martin Luther King, he did it so peacefully. Martin Luther King was stabbed. Martin Luther King was shot and killed. Martin Luther King was jailed. He did all this stuff. So when people say, oh, he did it the peaceful way, you know, he, he just, he didn't block any traffic or did it. He was so nice. He's, he was treated and all all the civil rights marchers were treated the exact same way as the folks who are protesting today. There were dogs, there were fire hoses. It was insane, people being spit on. Please don't tell me it was all peaceful back then. So yeah, this stuff is coming down, which is great. It's great, it's symbolic, but listen, we gotta do more than just paint Black Lives Matter on a street. We have to have fundamental change and that means and when we educate, we have to use books like, um, uh, whatchamacallit, Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. So we have perspectives with the immigrants and with black folks and with Mexican folks. We need to have comprehensive, we need to have books by people of color. I never read a book. I had more books where the protagonist were animals than people of color. That stuff has to change. And so we're watching, like one of the things that um, I spoke at the Library of Congress last year and this lady at the Library of Congress gave me a sheet and it was a test that black people had to take to vote. And it, you're not supposed to be able to have to take a test, but it was this crazy nutty test that if you didn't pass, then you couldn't vote. And we're seeing so much voter suppression right now. It's completely insane. And you would think that if you were truly a patriotic American, you would make it as easy for people to vote as possible. Yet there are people out there, specifically Republicans, who would, instead of coming with ideas that will attract people, they are more willing to purge the vote, to, to keep people, because they know, to keep people, as many people from voting as possible, they will win. And, and that is happening right before our very eyes. Like, why not just say, okay, well, you know, we, yeah, healthcare is, okay, healthcare seems like a pretty good idea. But maybe we shouldn't cut taxes on billionaires. Anyway, it's all happening. I just suggest that you vote, vote, and vote. Anyway, so let's jump quickly just to my show. Um, my show premiered last week. It's called Woke. 
Um, it's based on that incident I told you about with the police. It's much more dramatized in the show. It's supposed to take place in San Francisco, but we shot it in Vancouver um, because it's much cheaper, <laughs> but it was much colder. It snowed probably half the time we were there. Um, but uh, Lamorne Morris plays me. Um, Blake Anderson plays my roommate. That's Mo Marable, the great director. He was really amazing. But look at the guy playing the cop. Look at my, you put a, a uniform like that on somebody, it's just insane. Now, if you put somebody in military gear, they act even crazier. It's crazy how much we fund cops, yet we defund schools. Yet, you know, healthcare workers are wearing, you know, at the beginning of this pandemic, were wearing plastic bags, like they were totally ill-equipped. But cops have tanks, tanks. So uh, this some more of the guys, uh, T. Murph, uh, this is in front of the apartment. Uh, and this is a very big Easter egg. I played a koala in episode seven. I suggest that when you watch the show, watch it all. Not the kids though, not the little kids. There's some dirty stuff in it. So maybe you should watch it when your parents aren't on around. Anyway, um, I was the koala in it and I got to punch the guy who plays me. So this is the last comic strip. This is the tale of two viral emails. One is about a bumper sticker. The other is a kid. Is about a kid that looks like me. Racism in America is like that big pile of dog poop that sits on the grass in front of your apartment building. It's been there for as long as you can remember it, and nobody knows how it got there. Nobody wants it there, yet no one wants to clean it up. They say, why should I? I didn't leave it there. Soon you just accept it. You do your best to avoid and or ignore it. It's that pile of poop that allows someone like Trayvon Martin to be murdered while his killer walks. The flies that are attracted to that poop are the people who put don't renick bumper stickers on their vehicles. I don't care about the flies, just clean up the poop. So yeah, this is, this is that time. This is that time where you're gonna look back and say, you know, if you ever wondered what you would do if you were alive in the civil rights movement, now is the time to find out. Now, right now. So we're not doing enough because the people on the other side are pushing and they're pushing hard. So you can't be neutral in this. It's time to have the difficult conversations. Not everything is easy. And as a white person, you can avoid it if you want. But you have a privilege where you can make change in a way that I may not be able to, which is white people seem to listen to other white people more than people of color. It's important for you to give people of color a chance for them to speak out and to just sit back and listen. You will feel defensive, but you should listen. Not only should you should listen, you should think about how, how to make things better. And when people sit there and go, eh, I'm not racist. I don't keep teach my kids to be racist. Yeah, that's fine and dandy. You know, I don't litter. And I don't teach my kids to litter. I teach them not to litter. But that doesn't mean that we don't volunteer to clean up the forest or clean up the beaches because we have a system in place that allows a system to litter and destroy the oceans and destroy the forests. We have to, we can't sit back and be neutral. So call people out, call the boss out, call, call your racist uncle and aunt out. It's not easy, but I guarantee you they'll think twice before they say it again. It's super important for all of us to step up.
And, you know, I don't ever want to hear any of you say, well, I'm not racist. I have a black friend. You can be racist and have a black friend. You can be sexist and be married to a woman or have a mom. No one ever says, I'm not sexist. I have a sister. We have to step up and be better. All right, so uh, here's a bunch of neat stuff to read and but there's a lot more. Um, if anyone's interested in a list of anti-racist stuff, um, there's a lot of stuff. I have a list that I can send you and then you can just um, look into it yourself. It's a list of podcasts. It's a list of articles and books and TV shows and all this different stuff. Um, if you're interested in following my work, I'm on Patreon. Um, you can see all my comics before they hit other places. Um, and it's a great way to um, just get all the inside stuff on what I'm doing. Um, so that's it for my slideshow. Time for some Q&A, which is my favorite part. Um, I thank you for having me. And um, yeah, let's get to it. Okay, so thank you, Keith Knight, for such an excellent presentation and demonstrating the power comics have to change the world and to prompt constructive dialogue about racism in America. And thank you for encouraging all of us to take active roles in bringing about fundamental changes. You are a very powerful speaker and I feel so honored that you were here to join us. We do have a few audience questions. Well, we have one comment and um, it looks like we might have two comments and one question. So Mary Osborne says, hi, Keith. It's been a long time. Congrats on the show. Thank looks you. like I got a bunch more books to buy. And she says she still has your Christmas cards. Ah, very nice. That's very nice. <laughs> I, 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 rem I remember you, Mary. So it's nice. Uh, Carolyn McKinnon asks, what happened to your I Was a Teenage Michael Jackson Impersonator project? Ah, uh, yes. That is, that is the victim of my adventures in Hollywood as I launched this Kickstarter um, in 2012. It's about my time as a Michael Jackson impersonator. And um, it was right about the time I started, like, getting, going through this process of developing the show. And so um, it's happening, it's still going on. My management is on me because this is something that they want to pitch. So they want me to get it done. So I've just been working on that in the times that I'm able to do it. Um, uh, right now I'm heavily invested in promotion for the show. So, but late at night, I sneak down and I do some drawing for the, and, and I hope, my hope is to hopefully finish it when this stuff dies down, but it's coming. I was a teenage Michael Jackson impersonator. That's great. We can't wait to read more about that. And we have another very thoughtful comment for you. Um, Lippy writes, Keith, this talk has changed me. I signed up because I've been a fan of your work for many decades. So you'd think I was prepared for a social history lesson, but I was not expecting the path you have led me down. I can't unhear what you've taught today. Thank you. Things will change for me. Thank you. And honestly, it does. It's just one person at a time. You know, it's one it's a journey, like, and you just take the first step. And so many people say, oh, you know, well, I'm afraid of saying the wrong thing or doing, and I just say, like, you know, it's not easy, but it gets easier the more you talk about it. And I just say to people, if you just talk to a person of color and any, anybody, but if you talk to a black person who's o older than 60, for like 10 minutes, you will learn more about black history than you ever learned in any school, in any class or anything. Just even, 
I, I spent uh, some time just interviewing the elders in my family and just hearing the stories that they had. And I, I think what happens is, you know, it's tough for black folks because you don't want to, I, I do it with my own kids. You don't want to tell your kids too much about all the horrible things that, <laughs> that America does to its people to its marginalized people, because you don't want them to grow up like, you know, depressed and sad and all this stuff. But it's, you know, at a time, like you, you have to be real with them uh, at some point. And just hearing the stories of what my mom went through as a kid in Georgia is insane. It's crazy. And we don't tell these stories, but it, it continues to this day. I mean, there's a story just today that I was hearing about about the, the black and white couple, mixed race couple. And they had, they had, uh, they were looking to get their house. What's that thing where uh, an estimate or whatever, um, to find out how much it is, someone comes through it and they got a certain estimate on the house. And then when, then they took all the black stuff out of it. So pictures of black people, like any evidence of, of black people in it. And, and then this, the white guy was there and the, the house went up in value like crazy amounts just because there was no evidence of, of black people in there. That is, that is systemic racism. Most people think racism is just someone driving by and calling you something. But it's the fact that a car salesman will offer on an average of, a, you know, give you a black person a price of four car that's an average of $700 more. That's systemic racism. When, when you know, you look into uh, the boardroom of most of these corporations and it's all just these white dudes, like, and, you know, they have no perspective on sort of any, anything else beyond that, that's systemic, that is systemic racism. It, the fact that, again, that I have more animals as protagonists in the books I read than people, that's black people, that's systemic. And that's the stuff that we, I, I don't care that real estate people wanna get rid of the term master bedroom. That means nothing to me. You know, get me a mortgage, you know, get me a loan for a house that I don't have to jump through hoops for. That's, you know, that's real change. Any more questions? Yes, <laughs> we, ha we do have a question uh, from one of our librarian panelists. Mm -hmm. um, we would re be really interested in seeing that list of podcasts and the book suggestions just to see if it's anything that's not on our radars. But her question is, um, what do you do after, or what do you suggest people do after they read the books? As librarians, we always wonder what happens with the book, book list we make. What do you do? I mean, you put the stuff into action. Like you, you know, I, I would say anybody in positions of power work to work to get diverse educations, like work to get different teachers, teachers of color into schools. There was a survey with kids of all races and they responded most, all of the students to teachers of color more than anyone else. And this is the reason why kids learn so little about people of color that when they see someone in a teaching uh in a mentor position they respond they're like oh my all right this you know they don't my parents never told me that they always told me they were stay away from them and be scared of them and stuff like that but they always my high school the black teacher was always a favorite teacher like it's so important to have teachers to have people of color that kids can respond to in a positive way. 
it's very important. So that's, that's just one aspect of it, but you have to make the effort to, to diversify the people you interact with. If you, if you are just, yeah, it's so funny because you know, people always talk about when they say, oh, yeah, what about black on black crime? You never hear about white on white crime, even though it's practically the same. People do bad things to the people they're with, <laughs> like the, the people in their community. So the percentage of white on white crime is just about the percentage on black on black crime. And so when people sit there and say, well, what about black on black crime? Even if black on black crime, if there was one murder <laughs> in the US that was a, by a black person, it would probably be a black person. And that's 100% black on black crime. Is it better if black people attacked people of other races? So that, that argument of white on a black on black crime just doesn't make any sense to me. So I just say like, people just need to be called out on their stuff. They need to be, you know, it's a really interesting thing, but I got on Facebook a couple of years ago, someone wrote to me and said, um, they, they said they went to school with me. And this is like 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And they said, Keith, I want to thank you. When we were in a dormitory uh, in the dorms, I had said some sort of joke that you called me out on. And, he, and they said, you weren't angry about it. You just explained why it was a, an effed up joke and that it's, you know, it's BS, like it's offensive. And she said it stuck with her so much so that she started calling her family out on it. And and she started calling out friends and she just realized like now that her kid is playing with kids that she never played with, you know, like kids of different races and stuff. She just said, you know, I want to thank you for what you did that, that, that day. Now, I don't remember her. I don't remember the incident ever happening. I might've been under the influence, <laughs> but those little things actually uh, grow into something big. You may not remember them, but they grow into something a lot bigger. So, yeah. But I will send you the list of stuff. I will send it to you guys, and then maybe people can go straight to you for them. Great. That sounds great. Yeah. Speaking of remembering, Mary Osborne is touched that you remember her, and she said she's still drawing. She has two questions. Was your Monopoly cartoon inspired by Kimberly Jones's great rant that went viral back in June? Oh, no, no, not Oh, well, I don't know how old the rant was, but no, that was the Racial Equity Institute actually does these classes on racial equity. It's okay. Racial Equity Institute. And they <laughs> use that monopoly analogy. And I think it's just such a, a brilliant analogy because everyone's played monopoly and right. it really does. That's, that's what the best of what cartoons do is take metaphors. They take complex issues and put them in a way that people can kind of grasp. And um, so I really like that. I really responded to it. I did a series inspired by that. I did a series of different childhood games. So I had, um, oh, I, I did shoots and ladders and I had all <laughs> these broken, all these broken ladders and lots, way more shoots and even a gun shootings. And it's, you know. Like the play um, on words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just a bunch of different things like that. I, I'll, if you go to my Patreon, you might see it. <laughs> Great. We'll have to check that out. Um, Mary's other question uh, was she was very inspired about your discussion about taking money out of police pensions to pay for settlements on abusive cops. How can we make that happen? Um, I would just, you know, I think the more people talk about it, um, the more... I think people just say, like, I think that's a really good idea. Like, make police pay. Why should, why should, um, why should the average citizen pay for abusive cops, uh, for the, the faults of abusive cops? And, like, I mean, 
literally police have it, they have it in their budget. Like, you know, we're gonna not, I, I should say the police have it in their budget, but cities have it in the budget because they pay out like a certain, a crazy amount of, of um, payouts to, to pe victims of abuse. And I mean, that's, that's absurd. Like that they just are, are assuming that their costs are gonna be terrible every, every year. And um, yeah, it's crazy. But I would say, yeah, push that, suggest it to, you know, write to politicians um, and just, just write to the newspaper. You know, I've done it in tweets, I've done it in comics. I've suggested it every time I do a slideshow. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, another question we have, um, you mentioned that moment where you saw from inside looking out versus outside looking in. How did this change how you write? Well, I had been doing stuff about police brutality before then, but it just made me double and triple down, like really say, okay, this is like, I mean, I, I feel like I'm doing, I'm doing the right thing <laughs> by highlighting this stuff and talking about it. And so I probably did it even more often after, after that incident. And, and, and again, like it eventually developed into the slideshow that I did um, called They Shoot Black People. But after a while, I just realized that um, it's not just police brutality is just one aspect of it. It's like we have just this complete blind spot when it comes to race. And it's just so blatantly obvious. But I think to white people, they think it's just like a white, I mean, a black problem. But it's not like, you know, it, it's, if you, we are seeing it now, we are seeing it revealed with COVID that if your neighbors aren't being taken care of, you're going to be susceptible to something, you know, like we should be making sure that every citizen has health care, is healthy, has, you know, has a decent job, is able to, to make it now. And I, I tell people, like, you really want to help somebody? Like, you know, hire them. If you are a business person, hire people of color, get people in there, like, folk like open it up and expand your circle and horizon and like just we need to help each other out that's all I can say and and COVID has revealed it to us that you know when someone gets sick if someone doesn't have decent health care we know how this is affecting people of color more than more than whites and you know we just need to do better a lot better so now um, we have some questions about advice for young cartoonists and a special shout out to one of our young viewers, Henry, who wants to let you know that he's just getting started with comic drawings. Oh, excellent. Henri. I will call you Henri. <laughs> it's fancy French, French version. Um, so yeah, sure. So you want me to just say some advice? Any advice you might have for young cartoonists? Okay. Well, I would say this. Um, tell your story. Um, I'm a big fan of autobiographical comic strips and telling your story. Because if you don't tell your story, then someone else will, and they'll get it all wrong. And, and you'll, you'll hate it. Um, you know, a lot of stuff is written about the generation of today, and how they just you know, they're spoiled and this and that. And that's written by old people, jealous old people <laughs> that are jealous of your youth and the future that you have. Well, maybe not the future that you have, but my advice to you is tell your own story and everybody has a story to tell. And, um, and I think the more specific you are with that story, the more people relate to it. It's really interesting, but when I get real into detail about my story, people really dig it. So um, I think that's important. 
And the other thing is bring, have, you know, I, I know a lot of people don't use pen and paper anymore, but I bring a notebook with me all the time and I draw all the time. I practice all the time. And it's good to keep these notebooks for a really long time because I heard that R. Crumb actually bought his house in France by just giving people a bunch of sketchbooks and he bought a house with the sketchbooks. So if you save all your sketchbooks now, since you were young and just hold on to them, you could buy a house maybe later on. I didn't get my house with that, but I'm, I'm hoping to get maybe a small um, shed out in, in my yard that I can draw. Um, what's the other thing? Um, you know, the thing about cartooning is it's not just about the drawing. In fact, it's more about the writing. And when I say writing, it's just not about the words, but it's the ideas. Um, so really work on, on sort of your ideas and concepts and stuff. And also, if you see stuff you like, if you see cartoonists you like, it's okay to copy them and learn to do what they do and you'll develop your own style. Um, that's how I did it, which is, you know, you see stuff you like and you take a little bit of that, take a little bit of this and, and then you develop your own style. So that's my advice. And also marry someone rich. That's very <laughs> important. Marry a rich person and you'll be set as a cartoonist. <laughs> That's great advice. And thanks, as always, for the humor. Um, so those are all the questions I'm seeing. Natalie and Franklin, are you seeing any questions I missed? No, I don't see any more questions. But if you have any questions, it's the last chance to ask them, everybody. Type them in the chat box or the Q&A. So. Last call? Last call, right. OK. It doesn't look like anything else is coming in, so. All right. Well, I appreciate you all for coming uh, for this. I was very, very happy to be uh, on the West Coast again, <laughs> even, if it, even if it's virtual. Um, but, yeah, thanks for having me. Cool. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. It's good right, to see thank you. Thank you, Keen. This was great. And thank you, Ron, and the Ren Comics yeah, Fest. Thank you, Ron, for, uh, thank you all guys for doing it. Yeah, Ron, why are you hiding your, your <laughs> I, I got a bad backlighting here. I don't know. Oh, there we go. <laughs> you there got a go. lot of books. That's good. For I got a lot of books. Well, you know, I got to represent. <laughs> Librarians are watching me, so. Right. <laughs> and thank you, Franklin, for hosting. Sorry. Yes, you're welcome. You. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I just want to say I have a special um, place in my heart for librarians. I was a librarian all through college, my work study program. So I have a, a, a little space in my heart for librarians. And, it, 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 and libraries are socialism. Whenever I tell people, you know, people go, oh, socialism. I say, well, libraries are socialism. And if you don't like libraries, libraries are like music. I don't trust anybody who sits there and says, oh, I don't like libraries. You know, it's like those people need to be removed from society. So, <laughs> Do you have right. that people come up to you often say that? I don't like libraries. Are you encountering that often? No, but I mean, it's, <laughs> it, when people say, oh, uh, you know, socialism, uh, you know, giving everybody a, an equal shot, it's, it's horrible. I say, well, you know, what are libraries? Everyone can go in and read a book, right? <laughs> and uh, so then they don't, you know, they, they call me a communist. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you again. Yes. Um, it's, uh, what, what, and Mary's still there. Mary. Yeah. And Mary works at the Mill Valley Library. <laughs> okay. That's it. That's how I know Mary. Yeah. Okay. And that's Book good. Passage too. She's got her hand in, in all the books places. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> all right. It's good to see her. All right. So am I done? Can I go now? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> You're old and you need to go to bed. Um, and your show's great. I, I I don't know if anybody else has seen it yet, but it's, it's great. It's, yeah, I'm loving it. So, uh, excellent. Watch it to the end. That's what they look for: is that people <laughs> watch it to the very end, and it gets better as it goes. Like those yeah. last two episodes get really yeah. good. In the last yeah. few, but um, 
yeah, I, I just hope uh, I'm able to come to San Francisco and, um, and do a live presentation about it. Um, yeah. And frankly, I would love to get a second season and actually shoot in San Francisco. So we'll see, but it's too expensive. It's way too expensive. Yeah. But I miss the burritos. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, you guys. Cool. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank Have a great you. night.